Hello and welcome to Train Signal. You are watching a lesson about Linux installation planning. Your Linux tool belt is probably feeling a little heavier than when we started. It should now include knowledge of hardware settings, the boot process, and how run levels determine what mode you'll run the Linux kernel in. Hopefully you spent some time really digesting this information. Because now we'll move on to other topics, namely the hard disk. If you're an administrator, chances are you'll inherit an already functioning Linux installation. But just like the new Linux user, at some point you'll probably need to install the operating system from scratch. And where will the software be installed? Why, of course, on your system's hard disk. We know that the most basic function of a hard disk is to store our data for retrieval when we need to use it. So as we consider a new Linux installation, we need to begin thinking about the most efficient way to organize that data. Now while you could theoretically whip out an installation disk and plunge ahead, it's best to take some time to understand the layout of the disk and how to best customize your configuration. That's where we'll spend our time in this lesson. As part of the installation process, you'll install what's called a boot manager, which we touched on in the boot process lesson. This is the screen that you and your users will see when your systems boot up. Then we'll talk about shared libraries and how they make Linux run like a well-oiled machine. If you're ready, let's begin with the hard disk layout. I'm of the opinion that every Linux user and administrator alike would benefit from installing Linux at least once, but preferably a few times. This is where test systems or virtualization software like VirtualBox will come in handy. I learned early on to adopt the build it, break it, and fix it mentality. This is really the best way to learn. So you're ready to install Linux, but before you begin, you'll need to spend some time designing your hard disk layout, namely partitions. Partitions essentially segment your hard drive, and doing so has quite a few benefits. First, you can install multiple operating systems. It's not uncommon to have multiple distros of Linux and Windows running on the same system. For instance, my personal laptop has a copy of Fedora, Ubuntu Linux, Windows Vista, and Windows 7. Another benefit is hard drive space management. Depending on the number of users you support, your Linux installation can balloon in size. Separating user data from system files is another best practice. If a data partition fills up, or worse, experiences a failure, your critical system files aren't impacted. The same concept also applies to security. Your system partition may have different, more stringent security controls or permissions than a partition with user data. The Linux partitioning scheme uses four primary partitions, three primary and one extended. Primary partitions are numbered one through four, and logical partitions are
First, let's go ahead and close out Gparted. Then we'll open a terminal window. I'm sorry, with Applications, Accessories, and Terminal. Now, as you can see here, we're in the user Veronica's directory, so let's type in ls just to confirm that. Right, and these are the directories for this particular user. But we want to look at the directories for root. So to do that, we're going to type in cd space forward slash and hit enter. And as you can see, this changed from the tilde to the forward slash to indicate that we're in root. So now let's go ahead and type in ls and hit enter. This provides a list of the file system that we have. And as you can see, we have some recognizable directories like bin, we've got boot, we've got home and Etsy, we've even got opt, see temp here, user, and var. And if you guessed that you can also view this information graphically, you guessed right. First, let's exit the terminal, close that out. Now the directories and icons that you see on the screen are fully customizable and these are the ones that I've chosen to have on my desktop and yours probably looks a little different. For now let's go ahead and click on the home and if you see here on the left side if you see file system we're going to click on that and this gives you a graphical depiction of what we do bin
Now for this command, we'll have to obtain root privileges. So let's type in su and the root password. Now from here, we're going to use the cat command again to display file contents. So let's type in cat space forward slash boot forward slash grub forward slash m menu m e n u dot l s t and hit enter and you can see the contents of the file now here's something that threw me when first trying to configure my own file take a look at the line that reads root hd0 comma 0 right here this line demonstrates a bit of an odd difference between the way grub refers to disk drives the Linux OS would refer to the same drive as HDA. So accordingly, Linux drive HDB would be a grub drive HD1. This is an important distinction and one I'd really like to emphasize. Another point is that the drive is followed by a comma and a second zero. This represents the partition number, and the numbering starts with zero instead of the one that Linux uses. So again, Linux is HD1 is grub's hd0 comma 0 and that's not all grub creates its own root called the grub root and this isn't necessarily linux's root file system just remember that if you didn't create a separate partition for boot when you partitioned your hard disk grub's root will be used and includes the full path to refer to the root usually forward slash boot grub but if you did create a separate partition Grub's root partition will be the same as Linux's boot partition. Like Lilo, Grub has per image options. They are title, which again specifies the label. Root specifies the root partition. Again, this is the forward slash boot partition if you separated it. Otherwise, it's the Linux root represented by the forward slash. The kernel option describes the locations of the kernel and any kernel options you want to pass it, like for instance RO for read only. INITRD again specifies an initial RAM disk. Root no verify specifies a boot partition for operating systems like Windows, which Grub can't load directly. Chain loader says to give control to another bootloader. If you figured out that in order to add a kernel to Grub, you need to edit the menu.lst file, you're right. You need to obtain root or admin privileges, open the file in your favorite text editor, and essentially perform the same steps we did for Lilo. You copy the stanzas, make any changes, and save. The only difference again is that you'll need to reboot to have the changes take effect. You won't have to reinstall. Now Grub again will probably be installed by default, but to install it manually, you use the command grub dash install space device. So for instance, grub dash install space forward slash dev forward slash hda will install grub into the master boot record of your first hard drive. You can make grub edits in the configuration file or on the fly. When you boot up and the grub menu appears on your screen, you can use your arrow keys to move up and down the kernel listings and pressing E will allow you to edit that kernel option. Now that we've covered Linux's bootloaders, let's move on to our last topic, shared libraries. Programmers are familiar with the idea of a library. Basically, it's meant to make their lives easier through sharing commonly used program fragments. A popular Linux library is called the GIMP Toolkit, or GTK+, which contains on-screen widgets used by programs things like buttons and scroll bars. Under one scenario, library routines can be linked directly into the program's main file. But this would mean very large file sizes duplicated across every file that needed to access that library. This problem gave birth to the idea of shared libraries. Under this scenario, programs reference the shared library files that they need when they need them. Windows uses DLLs, or dynamic link libraries, similarly. But in order for programs to use library files, they have to know where to find them. For that, we use the library path. 
you set the path in the etsy slash ld dot so dot conf file. Let's take a quick look at the contents of that file. Let's type in clear to clear the screen. Then we're going to type in cat space forward slash etsy slash ld dot so dot conf. Hit enter and you can see that only one line appears and that says include space ld dot so dot conf dot d slash asterisk dot conf. This line uses the wildcard character asterisk to say load all the files in etsy ld dot so dot conf dot d whose names end in conf. Now you probably won't need to change the library path as package files usually install themselves in directories on the path or can automatically add their own paths. If you happen to install a library package or program that creates its own libraries, like those you compile from source code, in an unusual location, you may need to alter the path. If you need to temporarily change it, you set the ld underscore library path environment variable. This variable simply tells Linux where other library files may be located. The common syntax is export space ld underscore library underscore path equals the path. Each directory that you indicate on this line must be separated by a colon with no spaces. Now the first thing we should probably do is see if there's anything set for the current library path variable. And we do that with the echo command. So at the command prompt, let's type in echo space followed by the name of the variable, including the dollar sign. So we'll put in dollar sign ld underscore library underscore path. Echo ld underscore library underscore path. And let's enter. and we see that we don't have anything currently set. So to change again temporarily to change the contents of that variable we use the export command. So let's type in export space variable name with no dollar sign this time ld underscore library underscore path followed by the equal sign and let's set um, a temporary path at Etsy. and let's hit enter. Now let's use the up arrow key to go back to our echo command. Let's see if the new path is set. Hit enter and we can see that the new path is set to Etsy. Okay, let's go back to our presentation. Now what if a program won't run and reports the problem as being due to a missing library? You first need to find out which libraries the program uses, and you do that with the ldd command, which can be run either as root or a regular user. The most used option for this command is dash v, which displays a list of version info following the main entry. Now first thing that we need to do is to pick a program to try out, and we're going to need to know the program's location. So I'll pick the gedit text editor. So to use the command we type in ldd. We're going to use the dash v option to get all of the information. And then I'm going to type in the full path to the gedit program which I know is forward slash usr forward slash bin forward slash gedit. Let's make sure we have that typed in. LDD dash v for verbose user bin g edit and hit enter and what we have is a rather long listing of libraries that g edit is currently using along with the full path now technically you could use this information to figure out what's being used so that if you find something missing then you can add it Okay, let's go back to the presentation and talk a little bit about the library cache. 
As you know, your internet browser can store cached versions of websites you frequent for faster, later retrieval. The Linux library cache works similarly. It uses a cached version of files and directories stored in binary in etsy ld.so.cache, but the cache must be reloaded when you make any changes to the file, and you do so using the ldconfig command. Though you won't often need them, there are of course some options. Dash V displays the file updates as they're done. Dash capital N updates symbolic links, but not the cache. Dash lowercase n updates links in the specified directories. Dash capital X updates the cache, but not the links. Dash F space C-O-N-F-F-I-L-E says to use a new configuration file where confile is the name of that file. Dash capital C space cache file changes the cache file ldconfig creates, where cache file is the name of that new file. Dash r space dir says to read the directory as if it were root, and dash p will display the current cache. Let's head back to our terminal window and try out this command. Let's type in clear and then we'll type in ldconfig ldconfig space dash lowercase p and hit enter and as you can see in this rather long listing you can see the library files ending in so and their locations you most likely breathe a sigh of relief to know that that concludes this lesson. As evidenced by the plethora of material we've covered in this lesson, you can deduce the importance of planning your Linux installation. In this lesson, we began with a look at the Linux hard disk layout and partition schemes. We talked about the various mount points and how to properly organize these directories from the outset and how it can help you better manage your system afterwards. From there, we covered bootloaders, learning that Grub is now the default, but that on occasion you may run into Lilo, and that you should be very familiar with how to install, configure, and interact with them both. We wrapped up with a look at shared libraries, where the files are located, and how to manage them. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next lesson.